we pray that your spirit would move among your people, that you would talk to us corporately and individually. Speak your word into our hearts, Lord. Quicken it. Quicken it to us. That as was prayed earlier, when we leave this place today, we will have been changed having sat at your feet. Listen to your voice as you talk personally to us because that's what our relationship with you is. Personal, one-on-one with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so today we are going to be reviewing, summing up, if you will, chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters to the seven churches. Now, in all fairness, we could spend months and months and months just on the first three chapters of Revelation, but time will not allow that. So at some point, we have to move forward. So today we're going to summarize chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters. Each of the letters has a structure. Now, these letters, as we've mentioned before, are actually epistles given by Jesus Christ himself to these churches. Every opening has a, every letter has an opening, which I'm going to call the presentation. This presentation is extremely important and is one of the things we'll concentrate on today as we look at all seven of these. This presentation is how Jesus Christ presents himself to this congregation that he's giving the letter to. Extremely important. Next, in most cases, is the commendation, what you've done well, except for two churches which get no commendation. They did nothing well. Jesus didn't commend them for anything. Next comes the rebuke or the chastisement for things that they're not doing well. You could call it an encouragement or a rebuke or a chastisement. Now, Funny note, I hadn't even told my wife this, so she was with me. We recently went to an event, and it, it was a great event, and the, the, the food served, you, you choose in advance what you, what you want. And so I, I chose for my wife and I, and for my wife, I made a great selection. For me, not so great. So for those of you who know me, and I preface this with, you will never change this. Did you hear that? You will never change this. I don't eat vegetables. I just, I just don't. And so my selection was a turkey wrap, which I figured this is really safe because I'm, I'm trying to lose weight. I'm not going to eat the tortilla, but I'll just pick out the, the turkey and the vegetables. Well, that was wrong because basically what I got was a giant salad, which was all munched up into little tiny pieces wrapped in a tortilla. And, and I decided not to eat that. And... I don't typically get grumbly. I know I'm a picky eater, so I I don't get really grumbly about my food, at least not externally, so anyone could see, except my wife who sees everything. But I was sitting there for a minute, and and for just a minute, I was was a little, I was a little, uh, and it was like the Lord told me, I didn't send you here to eat. I sent you here to pray. That was a chastisement and a rebuke which encouraged me to no end because I knew the Lord had a personal involvement in what was going on there, as he does with everything. And yes, there was a rebuke in that, but it was a rebuke that brought me back into focus of why he sent me there. He didn't send me here to eat. He sent me here to pray. If there was things to eat, great. If there's not, great. That's not why I'm there. I'm there to pray. So... Sometimes we need a rebuke. Sometimes we need a chastisement. Amen? After this, there's a call to repentance in each of these letters. Now, where that call is located can vary, and that's going to be important, which we'll cover in the next coming weeks. And then there's a promise. So this is pretty typical of the seven letters. As I said, two of them have no commendation, nothing good said about them. Two of them have no rebuke, nothing wrong said about them. One of them is specifically promised to be taken out before the tribulation. One of them is specifically promised to be thrown into tribulation. Serious stuff. Each church has its own issues, good and bad. We'll just call them issues. I won't use the word problems, but issues. Each church has its own issues which the presentation or the opening puts into context. Each letter, Jesus presents himself 
as what is necessary for their situation. I'm going to paraphrase it, or not paraphrase it, but just use a Martinism. Jesus showed up and said, view me in this manner for what I'm about to tell you. And it's huge. It really changes the way we look at things. Bibles, you will probably see a heading that says the loveless church. Just be aware that was added by man. That's not in the original documents. It is accurate. Chapters, verses, and headings help us find things in scripture, help us sort things out in our own mind, but they're not divine. They're not inspired. They're not scripture. So just, just an FYI there. So Ephesus called the loveless church. How does Jesus present himself to them? To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now Jesus had already interpreted this for us in chapter 1. He who holds the seven stars. These are the messengers, the angels, the, I guess you could call them pastors of these seven churches. Jesus said, I hold them in the palm of my hand. He who holds the seven stars in his hand, right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. The seven golden lampstands typify his church. Jesus said, I hold my ministers in my hand as I walk among my church. The cure for the Ephesians' lack of love was a vision of Jesus Christ holding them in his hand, walking among his church. That was their cure. Their commendation in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Now, Jesus is politically correct. Can we get that out of the way? Jesus says hard words when it's time for hard words. He never does so without loving the one he's talking to. Love and hard words are not mutually exclusive. Sometimes we must say the truth in love, and it will be hard for someone to hear. But if it's the truth and we love them and we're telling them because it's true, then we must stand by that. So they say their apostles are not. I found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and not become weary. Praise God. The, even their commendations are in light of the fact that he holds the seven stars in his right hand and he walks among the golden lampstands. Because he holds his church and his ministers and by implication each and every one of us in the palm of his hand as he walks through his church. We can be faithful in the works he calls us to do. But he does have a rebuke. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. That's kind of serious. You have left your first love. Think about it in your marriage. If your wife told you or your husband told you, I just don't love you anymore at all. Now, I don't feel we can get divorced because that's not a godly thing to do. But I just simply don't love you anymore. Would that not be utterly devastating? The church is the bride of Christ. We are the one he sacrificed everything for. We're the one he bled for. We're the one he died for. He came not to be served, but to serve. And when we fall out of love with him, that's painful. That's painful to the Lord. Just as it would be if our spouse said, I don't love you anymore. I'm going to hang around, but I really don't love you. So just, just know that up front. I don't love you. Whew. Sometimes we get in that spot and don't even know it. We've gone a little cold. Our love for the Lord isn't what it once was. Yeah. So there's a call to repentance. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. What are the first works? This is very easy. What is the first and greatest commandment? Everything. 
Amen. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Repent. Turn back to that. Love the Lord God. Hmm. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a promise. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Praise God. Every single thing in this letter to Ephesus needs to be viewed through the lens of Jesus Christ. I am he who holds the seven stars in my right hand and walks among the golden lampstands. Let's move on to the next church, Smyrna, the persecuted church. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was, and this word was, insert became, because that's what it means in the Greek. I am the first and the last who became dead and came to life. Everything that follows in this letter to the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church, should be viewed in light of that opening statement. These things says the first and the last who became dead and came to life. This is a picture of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who suffered, who died, was faithful in his suffering, and was resurrected. Put that in mind when you read the rest of this letter. Now to their rebuke, they don't get one. There's nothing bad said about them. They were persecuted. The promise, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Whew. Amen, amen, and amen. You see, Jesus wears the crown that says, King of kings, Lord of lords, because he was faithful unto death. And the Father raised him up and gave him the crown, King of kings, Lord of Lords, and put all authority under his feet. And he tells them, in light of that, you do the same. And I will give you the crown of life. Verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Any more than Jesus Christ was hurt by his second death, first death. The metaphor falls apart a little bit. But Jesus Christ suffered death but he was not eternally hurt by it because he was resurrected. Amen? Moving on, Pergamus, chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Pergamus is called the compromising church. And we looked at that when we studied Pergamus. They let leaven in. They compromised. They weren't strong and diligent in removing compromise. It's a church married to the world, if you will. Verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Booyah. <laughs> That's quite a presentation. This is Jesus Christ opening to this church. Thus says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. Folks, a sword is not given to put butter on your rolls. You don't plow the field with it. You don't paint the house with it. A sword has two purposes, defense and offense. That's the only thing a sword is good for. The Word of God is the sword of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and it has two purposes, defense and offense. It will defend us from error, and it will go on offense against the kingdom of Satan and his power. Amen. The word is not given to paint the house. The word is not given to coddle feelings. The word is not given to make us feel good about ourselves. The word is given for defense and offense. And let me tell you, if you don't use it for defense, you better not use it for offense. Amen. And that right there sets the tone for the rest of this letter. But I have a few things against you because you have there 
those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will speak to you strongly. Um, will, I don't know, say strong, no. I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Offense. This church was corrupt. And Jesus said, repent, or else I will come on the offensive and will fight against these doctrines. Now, he doesn't say I'm going to fight against the believer and destroy those who have committed their lives to me. Jesus does not destroy those who come to him. He does rebuke and chasten those who he loves. But he doesn't come to fight them and destroy them. Put that in context. When you go back through and you read about this church, and you read about their compromise. View it through how Jesus opens the letter to them. Behold, I am he who holds the sword of the word of God. Hmm. Thyatira. And, and by the way, in this past church, they call it the compromising church. Now, if you recall in Ephesus, Jesus commended them because they couldn't stand the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Well, by now, they've become the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They've been accepted, they've been approved, they're hanging around in the fringe, they're now okay. In Thyatira, they become part and parcel of who they are. They're put into practice. To the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Thyatira is called the corrupt church. They are fully corrupted. This is a church married to the world who now acts like the world and uses the world system as their own. They're corrupt. And Jesus said, To the angel of this church, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Both of these are indicative of judgment. His eyes like a flame of fire, they pierce through. Nothing is hidden from his eyes. Nothing is hidden in darkness that his gaze won't pierce. Be not deceived, your sins will find you out. That's personal, public, corporate, and his whole body, his church. Judgment begins at the house of God. We've seen churches fall. We've seen ministries fall. Because what was hidden in darkness, his eyes piercing flames was able to pierce the darkness and pull out the corruption at the middle. Hmm. And his feet like fine brass. This is the one who walked through the fire of judgment on our behalf. Brass symbolizes judgment. Brass in the Old Testament was the only metal that could take the heat of judgment, the heat of burning, the heat of sacrifice. And so it typifies judgment. Jesus Christ is the only one who could take the heat of judgment. He is the only one who could stand. And his feet will forever be known as those who withstood the fire and the power of judgment on our behalf. View the rest of this letter in light of that. This is the Son of God who sees everything and will come in judgment. Jesus is coming. Amen? Ready or not, like it or not, prepared or not, one day Jesus is coming. And should he delay his coming, ready or not, like it or not, prepared or not, one day you will die and you will stand before those feet. Will you view his feet as blessed are those who bring the gospel or the tidings of good news? Or will you stand there looking at those feet of judgment? Like, man, I shouldn't have accepted you. But ready or not, we will all stand before Jesus Christ. So to this church, this corrupt church, he speaks in judgment. 
verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things to say to you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, folks, I hope you don't take this personally unless you're in danger, in which case I hope you do. Those who are teaching Jesus Christ's church today that sexual immorality doesn't matter anymore are in danger of judgment. What is important to God in Genesis all the way through to Revelation is important in God to God today. If it was immoral and he spoke against it then, it's immoral and he speaks against it today. But within the corrupt church at large, there are many who teach those things are old. Jesus didn't really understand human sexuality. And therefore, we, we have to address this based on science or emotion or needs. Folks, that is not so. We cannot compromise and be corrupt. Jesus won't allow it. Hmm. And I've given her time, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. You know, God told Israel once, all day long I have stretched out my hand to a stiff-necked and rebellious people, but they did not repent. See, God is patient. God is long-suffering. God is not willing that any should perish. God has warned and warned and warned and warned and will continue to warn, just like he did the world in the days of Noah, until God's very own hand closed the door. Noah didn't close the door to the ark. God did. The world didn't close the door to the ark. God did. One day that door is going to close again, and that's called the rapture. More to come on that. Verse 22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Folks, the churches need to know that Jesus Christ is our Lord, our Savior, and our judge. Amen? If he is your Lord and Savior and you love him, you don't fear his judgment because it will be righteous. But he's still our judge. Amen? And the promise, verse 26, And he who overcomes and keeps my word till the end, to him I will give power over the nations. This is singular. There is no promise to the corrupt church that they will be saved. In fact, to this one, they're specifically promised they will be cast into great tribulation because of their corruption. But to he who overcomes, personal, and keeps my word to the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, they shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. Just a couple of notes here. There's a vast difference between individual salvation and corporate mission. Prime example, if this fellowship, this congregation known as Valley Christian Church, if the Lord should decide your time is through and he closes these doors, does that mean everyone in here is no longer saved? No, it means our corporate mission is over. Now, that might be because God has ordained something different and it's time to move on. It could be because there was sin in the midst that wasn't addressed. It could be because we got corrupt, rebellious, immoral. Who knows? God could close that because of our faults. Or he could close it and move it on. But that's our corporate mission. That's not our individual salvation. Amen. Thank you, brother. Because Jesus said, those who come to me, I give them eternal life. Present perfect tense. I give it and will always give it. It doesn't say I give you temporary life. I give you eternal life. Our individual salvation is based on his faithfulship. Our corporate mission and our corporate rewards, if you will, have a lot to do with how we serve. Big difference, big difference. 
And in verse 27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. Bear in mind, as I said, everything in this letter needs to be looked at through the opening presentation of Jesus, which was, this thing says, the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. And he basically closes the letter saying, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And who is he? Jesus. Jesus shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. As I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. Whew. Moving on to Church of Sardis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is known as the dead church. To the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. This is how Jesus presents himself to the dead church. These who has the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold spirit of God. He who has the completeness, the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. And the seven stars. What were the seven stars? Ministers of the seven churches. So this is what Jesus opens his epistle to the dead church with. This says he who has the complete fullness of the Holy Spirit and holds the ministers to these churches in my hand. Bear that in mind as we go forward. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you're dead. I'm looking very diligently here for their commendation. But it ain't there. It's a blank spot. Nothing good for this church. Verse 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And we talked about this when we were going over this church in depth. There are a few names, personal. There's a remnant, and I believe there's a small remnant in this in this church. There are those who will walk with me in white. They haven't defiled their garments, and they're worthy. Not because they were worthy, but because they're full of the Spirit, which says that he's worthy. Amen? He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. The cure for the dead church is a presentation of Jesus Christ, full of the Holy Spirit, who holds his church in his right hand. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no life. You know, many people have said, if the Holy Spirit just left the church in North America, for the most part, it'd just continue on business as usual. Nothing would change. And that's a sad commentary. Because it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's what Jesus is saying here. To the dead church who does not have my spirit. And I'm not talking Pentecostal doctrines here. I'm talking scriptural, God-given. He who does not have the spirit of Christ is not Christ. Amen? That's the cure for a dead church. Is to view Jesus Christ as the one who who pours out his spirit on those who come to him, profess him as Lord and Savior, and confess with their mouth that he is Lord, Jesus sheds his spirit into their heart. New heart, new life, new creation. Now let's move on to Philadelphia. Their opening, their introduction, in chapter 3, verse 7, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Now, Brother Jerry covered this letter very well a few weeks ago. This presentation right here is one of kingly authority. And it's not a new thing. It's not a recent development. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, please. We're going to look at a couple examples here. 
but don't think for a minute there's there's only a couple. There are lots and lots and lots of Old Testament scriptures to give us a taste and a foreview of the coming Messiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verse, let's do to 6. Verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is one of our favorite Christmas time verses to be put on our cards. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This implies the son was preexistent, and he was given to us. And the government will be upon whose shoulder? His shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of who? David. And over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And as we've talked many times, our prophetic view of scriptures, God says what he means, means what he says. When he says forever, he doesn't mean for a little while until we change the meaning. When he says forever, he means forever. Has this happened yet? No. There hasn't been a throne of David since the return of captivity under Babylon. It has not been possible at any point of time since their return under Babylon for this to have taken place. Not possible. Which means it will take place. Amen? Because what God says, he will bring to pass. Now jump forward to Isaiah chapter 22, please. See where we want to pick up. Uh, let's pick up in verse 20. Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Now, this is a historical figure. Eliakim was an actual man that God called, set in office, to take care of some problems in the nation of Israel at that time. But he's also looking forward to Jesus Christ. This is the very prophetic of Christ. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall shut and no one shall, sh he shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place, and he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. So when Jesus speaks to this church in Philadelphia, he opens his epistle to them with a picture of him with his kingly divine authority, the key of David. Jesus owns the right, owns the title to sit on the throne of David when it's rebuilt. He and he alone owns the rights to the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He and he alone and none other. Amen? So the encouragement to the faithful church, and by the way, they don't have any rebuke. Great commendations, no rebuke. Their encouragement to continue is found in this presentation of Jesus Christ as the Lord of Lords. I also want to review or bring to mind Micah 5.2, another one of our great Christmas passages. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Everybody, without question, views this as messianic. The priests, the scribes, the Pharisees were looking for this. They were looking for the Messiah. What they weren't looking at was the rest of the verse. Who's going forth are from old, from everlasting. Jesus Christ, the one to be born in Bethlehem of Judah. His goings forth were from old, which means the vanishing point. Look as far back as you can look, and he's already there. 
Look as far forward as you can look. He's already there. From the vanishing point, eternal. The picture of Jesus Christ, the eternal king, who by faithfulness inherited that crown. Amen? Now let's look at their promise. Verse 10. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Jerry also mentioned this in his treatise of this letter. Those who dwell on the earth is a technical phrase that you will come to many times in the book of Revelation after chapter 4. Those who dwell on the earth, earth dwellers, are those whose home is here. Now we sang and we talked earlier, this is not our home. We're passing through. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. He dwelt in tents as a sojourner as he passed through this place, headed towards his final destination. We are the same. We are seated with him in Moreno Valley. No. We are seated with him in the heavenly places. We are seated with him where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We're passing through, folks. As bad as this place can possibly get, it's a waypoint. We're going through. We're going to pass through. One of my favorite verses that came to pass. Didn't come to stay. It came to pass. <laughs> it's a joke, but, but applicable. We're passing through this place. We're headed somewhere else. That's our promise. But you see, this phrase refers to those who do not have that viewpoint. This phrase refers to those who dwell on the earth. This is their heaven. This is their hope. This is their glory. This is what they have. And the sad thing is, it's only that way because they want it to be. It's only that way because they reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you're going to see that fleshed out, brought to dramatic proportions as we go through the book of Revelation. Oftentimes we think now people don't believe because they haven't heard the gospel well enough yet. People don't believe because we didn't use the right words. We didn't say the right things. I didn't go when I should have gone. What we're going to see in the book of Revelation is as judgment begins to fall, people will cry out for the mountains to fall on them to hide them from the wrath of of the Lamb. They know where wrath is coming from. They know who's doing it. They know why he's doing it. And still, the word says, and yet men did not repent from their evil and their sorceries because we will not have this man rule over us. That's what it boils down to, folks. So the promise to the faithful church because you've kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth, world to test those who dwell on the earth. This church is specifically promised to be taken out before that trial that comes upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. And that really should say in the English, suddenly. It doesn't mean, behold, I'm coming in a matter of minutes. Quick, quick, quick. No, it means when I come, it happens rapidly. Boom. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's quick. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Huh. Sounds kind of familiar. Didn't we just read something about I will fasten him as a peg in my temple? Almost sounds like the same guy wrote this whole Bible, doesn't it? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Now, a lot of people are into tattoos. And, you know, you, I hear the phrase there every now and then, nice ink, man. Nice ink, man. Well, you know what? We have all got some really nice ink coming. Amen. Man, now, the downer church, Laodicea, chapter 3, four, verses 14 through 22, the lukewarm church, 
to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The cure for the lukewarm church was and is the presentation of Jesus Christ as several things. The Amen, which means so be it, firm, trustworthy, sure. Jesus Christ is the Amen. He's the faithful. Again, not a new thing. Deuteronomy 7, verses 9 and 10. Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. And He repays those who hate Him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with those who hate Him. He will repay Him to His face. Hmm. New Testament, 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Hebrews 3, 1 and 2. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all of his house. Jesus Christ earned his title. Yes, he was God. Yes, he's eternal. His going forth are from old, from everlasting. But the Son of Man, the Savior of all mankind, was earned because he was faithful to the Father unto death. And all that the Father called him to do. Mm. Revelation 19.11 Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. So one of the cures to being lukewarm is to see our Jesus as the Amen and as faithful. He's also the true witness. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You see, Jesus did not come to the earth to give us some of the truth. I used to teach welding, and over the course of years, I've assisted guys, I wouldn't say teach, with auto mechanics or hot riding and stuff. And so I could say, I've come to help you with your welding. I'll, I'll show you some welding things. I could not, cannot, never will I ever be able to say, I have come, I am the truth. I am all truth. But Jesus did. Jesus is the truth. He did not come to give us some truth. He came because he is all truth. He didn't come to shed light on a dark world by measure. He didn't come to turn on a little flashlight. He brought light into a dark, dead world. Mm. Mm. Jesus is the true witness. And he's the creator. The beginning of the creation of God. John 1, 1 through 5. We'll never get tired of reading this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Nothing. In the Greek, that means nothing. In the Aramaic, that means nothing. In the Hebrew, nothing. There's no way to confuse this. Without Jesus Christ, nothing has been made that has been made. Nothing. Hmm. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. See, the cure for being lukewarm is to know that Jesus Christ, get a picture of him, the amen, the so be it, ever faithful, ever true, the creator, creator God. That helps with lukewarmness, does it? It does me. One of the things about being lukewarm is understanding someday, maybe far off, maybe not far off, some of us are closer to death than others, 
Hopefully, we're all very close to rapture. But at some point, we will all stand before him. And I can promise you this. There will not be much lukewarmness in heaven. That's facetious. There will not be any lukewarmness in heaven. There will not be one person living dead, past, present, and future who looks at Jesus Christ with some type of ambivalence or indifference. No, sir. No, sir. He will either be my Lord and my God, my Savior. Thank you for your cross. I'll spend eternity with you. Or he will be my Lord and my God. Your judgment is just. But there won't be any lukewarmness in heaven. Hmm. And the scary thing is in this section in Laodicea that we studied, verse 20 and 21, has a, a warning along with a promise. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So the amen, the faithful and true witness the creator God is standing outside this organization asking to come in. That's the key for lukewarmness. Lord, have I put you outside? If so, forgive me. I open the door. Come back in. Hmm. Applications. We've also discussed each one of these letters has at least four applications, at least four, four levels. There was the local contemporaneous church, if you will. The church in Ephesus in 95 AD needed this letter from Jesus Christ. He sent it to them. The church in Laodicea, the church in Smyrna, the church in Pergamos, the seven churches that time, that age, their condition, they needed these letters from Jesus. They needed encouragement. They needed strengthening. They needed taught. They needed a vision of Christ. They needed these things, and he sent them. These churches, this time, by name. Never forget that. But it was also all churches at the time. These letters were to be read in all the churches, to all the congregations. And not just at that time, but throughout church history. These letters are to be read among the churches, all churches of all time. It's terrifying to me how many places will not teach certain sections of Scripture. Folks, there is nothing in the Word of God that we can avoid. There's nothing in God's Word that He felt important enough to give us that we can tell Him, sorry. Not so important to me. Thank you for taking the time to put that down. I'll pass that on to someone who really needs it. <sighs> Folks, the scary things, the hard things, the things that burn, those are the ones we need. Amen? I love Mark Twain's quote. He said, it's not the parts of the Bible I understand that bother me. It's the parts that I don't. Or maybe it was the parts I like. Yeah. Anyway, so that's the point. You know, the things that convince and convict and reprove and rebuke us are just as important as the things that encourage us. Otherwise, we have false encouragement. Amen? These letters also have an individual application to each and every single believer in all of the church age. Whatever condition we find ourselves in can be typified in one of these seven letters or a combination thereof. There's not a single believer in Christ's church that does not need to be familiar with these seven letters. It outlines the conditions we can find ourselves in. It outlines our past, our present, our future. It's warning. It's encouragement. It's rebuke. It's guidance. We need these. And we need to put them in context. For individuals, are we loveless like Ephesus? If so, go back and read the opening, the presentation of Christ to Ephesus. See what it does to your heart. If you're persecuted like Smyrna, we need to be encouraged. Go back and see how Jesus presented himself to the church in Smyrna. Are we compromising like Pergamus? 
Better go back and look how Jesus presented himself to the compromising church. Are we corrupt like Thyatira? Go and look. Are we dead like Sardis? We better find out how we get life by looking at how Christ presented himself to Sardis. Are we faithful like Philadelphia? If we are, guess what? Trial's coming, persecution's coming. If we're faithful today, don't be proud of that because tomorrow I hadn't got here yet. <laughs> he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. If we feel we're being faithful and we're thankful for that, go to the letter to Philadelphia and read how Jesus introduces himself to that church as a warning to keep us humble. Amen? Are we lukewarm like Laodicea? Is Jesus outside knocking on the door wanting to come in? If so, go back. See how he introduces himself to them. See how that applies to your life. In all things pertaining to life and godliness, we have the answers in the Word of God. And I would just encourage you that in virtually all cases, it will be how Christ presents himself through his Word. Jesus told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life. But I tell you, it is they which testify of me. This entire book is a love letter written to a fallen, lost people, showing them who God is and the lengths that he will go through to save us from ourselves. Now, the last of the four applications here is prophetic. I do believe these seven churches outline church history, the eon of church history, the church age, the times of the Gentiles. There's several, several technical names for it. And we'll look at some of those next week. I'd also like to encourage you in the next coming week, we're going to do something fun next week. We're going to look at the seven kingdom parables in Matthew chapter 13 and see if maybe there's some correlation. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. Look to it and see. So we'll, we'll take some time next week to do that. Today, as we close this message and move into communion, I don't think I could have asked for a better segue or come up with one. Because you see, what we needed, what every church in Revelation needed, all seven churches needed a vision of Jesus Christ for them. This is an eternal vision of Jesus Christ for each and every one of us. So today, as we, would, as we take communion, I do want to encourage you, if you're here and a visitor, we have no restrictions on communion, only the biblical ones that say you must be a believer. Jesus told us, as often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. This can be called a holy sacrament. And some would tell you by partaking in this, you are guaranteeing yourself certain spiritual advantages. Now, I would tell you this is not scriptural. What Jesus said, and I tend to listen to him, as often as you do so, as often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. This is not a magic genie that we rub that guarantees God will do our bidding. We're not saved through communion. We're not sanctified through communion. What we are is given a fresh picture of Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins.